Introduction and Preface to Social Statics This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Social Statics by Herbert Spencer Preface Being somewhat at variance with precedent, the tone and mode of treatment occasionally adopted in the following pages will, perhaps, provoke criticism. Whether, in thus innovating upon established usage, the writer has acted judiciously or otherwise, the event must determine. He has not, however, transgressed without adequate motive, having done so under the belief that, as it is the purpose of a book to influence conduct, the best way of writing a book must be the way best fitted to effect this purpose. Should exception be taken to the manifestations of feeling now and then met with, as out of place in a treatise having so scientific a title, it is replied that, in the present phase of progress, men are but little swayed by purely intellectual considerations that to be operative these must be enforced by direct or implied appeals to the sentiment and that provided such appeals are not in place of but merely supplementary to the deductions of logic no well-grounded objection can be made to them the reader will find that the several conclusions submitted to him are primarily based on entirely impersonal reasoning by which alone they may be judged and if for the sake of commending these conclusions to the many the sympathies have been indirectly addressed the general argument cannot have been thereby weakened if it has not been strengthened possibly the relaxations of style in some cases used will be censured as beneath the gravity of the subject in defence of them it may be urged that the measured movement which custom prescribes for philosophical works is productive of a monotony extremely repulsive to the generality of readers that no counterbalancing advantages are obtained the writer does not assert but for his own part he has preferred to sacrifice somewhat of conventional dignity in the hope of rendering his theme interesting to a larger number london december eighteen fifty introduction the doctrine of expediency section one give us a guide cry men to the philosopher we would escape from these miseries in which we are entangled a better state is ever present to our imaginations and we yearn after it but all our efforts to realize it are fruitless we are weary of perpetual failures tell us by what rule we may attain our desire whatever is expedient is right is one of the last of the many replies to this appeal true rejoined some of the applicants with the deity right and expedient are doubtless convertible terms for us however there remains the question which is the antecedent and which is the consequent granting your assumption that right is the unknown quantity and expediency the known one your formula may be serviceable but we deny your premises a painful experience has proved the two to be equally indeterminate nay we begin to suspect that the right is the more easily ascertained of the two and that your maxim would be better if transposed into whatever is right is expedient let your rule be the greatest happiness to the greatest number interposes another authority that like the other is no rule at all it is replied but rather a denunciation of the problem to be solved it is your greatest happiness of which we have been so long and so fruitlessly in search albeit we never gave it a name you tell us nothing new you merely give words to our want what you call an answer is simply our own question to the right side up if this is your philosophy it is surely empty for it merely echoes the interrogation have a little patience returns the moralist and i will give you my opinion as to the mode of securing this greatest happiness to the greatest number there again exclaim the objectors you mistake our requirement we want something else than opinions we have had enough of them every futile scheme for the general good has been based on opinion and we have no guarantee that your plan would not add one to the list of failures have you discovered a means of forming an infallible judgment if not you are for aught we can perceive as much in the dark as ourselves True, you have obtained a clearer view of the end to be arrived at, but concerning the route leading to it, your offer of an opinion proves that you know nothing more certain than we do. We demur to your maxim because it is not what we wanted, a guide, because it dictates no sure mode of securing the desideratum, because it puts no veto upon a mistaken policy, because it permits all actions, bad as readily as good, provided only the actors believe them conducive to the prescribed end your doctrines of expediency or utility or general good or greatest happiness to the greatest number afford not a solitary command of a practical character let but rulers think or profess to think that their measures will benefit the community and your philosophy stands mute in the presence of the most egregious folly or the blackest misconduct this will not do for us we seek a system that can return a definite answer when we ask is this act good and not like yours reply yes if it will benefit you if you can show us such an one if you can give us an axiom from which we may develop successive propositions until we have with mathematical certainty solved all our difficulties we will thank you if not we must go elsewhere in his defence 
our philosopher submits that such expectations are unreasonable he doubts the possibility of a strictly scientific morality moreover he maintains that his system is sufficient for all practical purposes he has definitely pointed out the goal to be attained he has surveyed the track lying between us and it he believes he has discovered the best route and finally he has volunteered as pioneer having done this he claims to have performed all that can be expected of him and deprecates the opposition of these critics as factious and their objections as frivolous let us examine this position somewhat more closely section two assuming it to be in other respects satisfactory a rule principle or axiom is valuable only in so far as the words in which it is expressed have a definite meaning the terms used must be universally accepted in the same sense otherwise the proposition will be liable to such various constructions as to lose all claim to the title a rule we must therefore take it for granted that when he announced the greatest happiness to the greatest number as the canon of social morality its originator supposed mankind to be unanimous in their definition of greatest happiness this was a most unfortunate assumption for no fact is more palpable than that the standard of happiness is infinitely variable in all ages amongst every people by each class do we find different notions of it entertained to the wandering gypsy a home is tiresome whilst the swiss is miserable without one progress is necessary to the well-being of the anglo-saxons on the other hand the esquimax are content in their squalid poverty have no latent wants and are still what they were in the days of tacitus an irishman delights in a row a chinese in pageantry and ceremonies and the usually apathetic javan gets vociferously enthusiastic over a cockfight the heaven of the hebrew is a city of gold and precious stones with a supernatural abundance of corn and wine that of the turk a harem peopled by houris that of the american indian a happy hunting ground in the norse paradise there were to be daily battles with magical healing of wounds whilst the australian hopes that after death he shall jump up a white fellow and have plenty of sixpences descending to individual instances we find louis the sixteenth interpreting greatest happiness to mean making locks instead of which his successor read making empires it was seemingly the opinion of lycurgus that perfect physical development was the chief essential to human felicity plotinus on the contrary was so purely an ideal in his aspirations as to be ashamed of his body indeed the many contradictory answers given by grecian thinkers to the question what constitutes happiness have given occasion to comparisons that have now become trite nor has greater unanimity been shown amongst ourselves to a miserly elwes the hoarding of money was the only enjoyment of life but day the philanthropic author of sanford and merton could find no pleasurable employment save in its distribution rural quietude books and a friend are the wants of the poet a tuft hunter longs rather for a large circle of title acquaintance a box at the opera and the freedom of Elmax. the ambitions of the tradesman and the artist are anything but alike and could we compare the air castles of the ploughman and the philosopher we should find them of widely different orders of architecture generalizing such facts we see that the standard of greatest happiness possesses as little fixity as the other exponents of human nature between nations the differences of opinion are conspicuous enough on contrasting the hebrew patriarchs with their existing descendants we observe that even in the same race the beau ideal of existence changes the members of each community disagree upon the question neither if we compare the wishes of the gluttonous schoolboy with those of the earth-scorning transcendentalist into whom he may afterwards grow do we find any constancy in the individual so we may say not only that every epoch and every people has its peculiar conceptions of happiness but that no two men have like conceptions and further that in each man the conception is not the same in any two periods of life the rationale of this is simple enough happiness signifies a gratified state of all the faculties the gratification of a faculty is produced by its exercise to be agreeable that exercise must be proportionate to the power of the faculty if it is insufficient discontent arises and its excess produces weariness hence to have complete felicity is to have all the faculties exerted in the ratio of their several developments and that an ideal arrangement of circumstances calculated to secure this constitutes the standard of greatest happiness but the minds of no two individuals contain the same combination of elements duplicate men are not to be found there is in each a different balance of desires therefore the conditions adapted for the highest enjoyment of one would not perfectly compass the same end for any other and consequently the notion of happiness must vary with the disposition and character that is must vary indefinitely whereby we are also led to the inevitable conclusion that a true conception of what human life should be is possible only to the ideal man we may make approximate estimates but he only in whom the component feelings exist in their normal proportions is capable of a perfect aspiration and as the world yet contains none such it follows that a specific idea of greatest happiness is for the present unattainable it is not then to be wondered at if paley's and bentham's make vain attempts at definition the question involves one of those mysteries which men are ever trying to penetrate and ever failing 
it is the insoluble riddle which care sphinx-like puts to each newcomer and in default of answer devours him and as yet there is no oedipus nor any sign of one the allegation that these are hypercritical objections and that for all practical purposes we agree sufficiently well as to what greatest happiness means will possibly be made by some it were easy to disprove this but it is unnecessary for there are plenty of questions practical enough to satisfy such cavillers and about which men exhibit none of this pretended unanimity for example what is the ratio between the mental and bodily enjoyments constituting this greatest happiness there is a point up to which increase of mental activity produces increases of happiness but beyond which it produces in the end more pain than pleasure where is that point some appear to think that intellectual culture and the gratifications derivable from it can hardly be carried too far others again maintain that already amongst the educated classes mental excitements are taken in excess and that were more time given to a proper fulfilment of the animal functions a larger amount of enjoyment would be obtained if greatest happiness is to be the rule it becomes needful to decide which of these opinions is correct and further to determine the exact boundary between the use and abuse of every faculty which is most truly an element in the desired felicity content or aspiration the generality assume as a matter of course that content is they think it the chief essential to well-being there are others however who hold that but for discontent we should have been still savages it is in their eyes the greatest incentive to progress nay they maintain that were content the order of the day society would even now begin to decay it is required to reconcile these contradictory theories and this synonym for greatest happiness this utility what shall be comprised under it the million would confine it to the things which directly or indirectly minister to the bodily wants and in the words of the adage help to get something to put in the pot others there are who think mental improvement useful in itself irrespective of so-called practical results and would therefore teach astronomy comparative anatomy ethnology and the like together with logic and metaphysics unlike some of the roman writers who held the practice of the fine arts to be absolutely vicious there are now many who suppose utility to comprehend poetry painting sculpture the decorative arts and whatever aids the refinement of the taste whilst an extreme party maintains that music dancing the drama and what are commonly called amusements are equally worthy to be included in place of all which discordance we ought to have agreement whether shall we adopt the theory of some that felicity means the greatest possible enjoyment of this life's pleasures or that of others that it consists in anticipating the pleasures of a life to come and if we compromise the matter and say it should combine both how much of each shall go to its composition or what must we think of this well thinking age of ours shall we consider the total absorption of time and energy in business the servitude of the mind to the needs of the body the spending of life in the accumulation of the means to live as constituting greatest happiness and act accordingly or shall we legislate upon the assumption that this is to be regarded as the veracity of a larva assimilating material for the development of the future psyche similar unsettled questions might be indefinitely multiplied not only therefore is an agreement as to the meaning of greatest happiness theoretically impossible but it is also manifest that men are at issue upon all topics which for their determination require defined notions of it so that in directing us to this greatest happiness to the greatest number as the object towards which we should steer our pilot keeps the word of promise to our ear and breaks it to our hope what he shows us through his telescope is a fata morgana and not the promised land the real haven of our hopes dips far down below the horizon and has yet been seen by none it is beyond the ken of seer be he never so far sighted faith not sight must be our guide we cannot do without a compass section three even were the fundamental proposition of the expediency system not thus vitiated by the indefiniteness of its terms it would still be vulnerable granting for the sake of argument that the desideratum greatest happiness is duly comprehended its identity and nature agreed upon by all and the direction in which it lies satisfactorily settled there yet remains the unwarranted assumption that it is possible for the self-guided human judgment to determine with something like precision by what methods may be achieved experience daily proves that just the same uncertainty which exists respecting the specific ends to be obtained exists likewise respecting the right mode of attaining them when it's supposed to be known in their attempts to compass one after another the several items which go to make up the grand total greatest happiness men have been anything but successful their most promising measures having commonly turned out the greatest failures let us look at a few cases when it was enacted in bavaria that no marriage should be allowed between parties without capital unless certain authorities could see a reasonable prospect of the parties being able to provide for their children it was doubtless intended to advance the public wheel by checking improvident unions and redundant population a purpose most politicians will consider praiseworthy and a provision which many will think well adopted to secure it nevertheless this apparently sagacious measure has by no means answered its end the fact being that in munich the capital of the kingdom half the births are illegitimate those two were admirable motives 
and very cogent reasons which led our government to establish an armed force on the coast of africa for the suppression of the slave trade what could be more essential to the greatest happiness than the annihilation of the abominable traffic and how could forty ships of war supported by an expenditure of seven hundred thousand pounds a year fail to wholly or partially accomplish this the results have however been anything but satisfactory when the abolitionists of england advocated it they little thought that such a measure instead of preventing would only aggravate the horrors without sensibly mitigating the extent of the traffic that it would generate fast sailing slavers with decks one foot six inches apart suffocation from close packing miserable diseases and a mortality of thirty five per cent they dream not that when hard pressed a slaver might throw a whole cargo of five hundred negroes into the sea nor that on a blockaded coast the disappointed chiefs would as at gallinus put to death two hundred men and women and stick their heads on poles along shore in sight of the squadrona in short they never anticipated having to plead as they now do for the abandonment of coercion again how great now self-evident to the artisan mind were the promised advantages of that trades union project whereby master manufacturers were to be dispensed with if a body of workmen formed themselves into a joint stock manufacturing company with elective directors secretary treasurer superintendents foremen etc for managing the concern and an organization adapted to ensure an equitable division of profits amongst the members it was clear that the enormous sums previously pocketed by the employers would be shared amongst the employed to the great increase of their prosperity yet all past attempts to act out this very plausible theory have somehow or other ended in miserable failures another illustration is afforded by the fate which befell that kindred plan recommended by mr babbage in his economy of manufactures as likely to be to the benefit of the workmen and to the interest of the master that namely in which factory hands were to unite together and have an agent to purchase by wholesale those articles which are most in demand as tea sugar bacon etc and to retail them at prices which will just repay the whole cost together with the expenses of the agent who conducts their sale after fourteen years trial a concern established in pursuance of this idea was abandoned with the joint consent of all parties mr babbage confessing that the opinion he expressed on the advantage of such societies was very much modified and illustrating by a series of curves the quick rise and gradual decline of the experimental association the spitalfields weavers afford us another case in point no doubt the temptation which led them to obtain the act of seventeen seventy three fixing a minimum of wages was a strong one and the anticipations of greater comfort to be secured by its enforcement must have seemed reasonable enough to all however fortunately the weavers did not consider the consequences of being interdicted from working at reduced rates i had little expected that before seventeen ninety three some four thousand looms would be brought to a stand in consequence of the trade going elsewhere to mitigate distress appearing needful for the production of the greatest happiness the english people have sanctioned upwards of one hundred acts in parliament having this end in view each of them arousing out of the failure or incompleteness of previous legislation men are nevertheless still discontented with the poor laws and we are seemingly as far as ever from their satisfactory settlement but why cite individual cases does not the experience of all nations testify to the futility of these empirical attempts at the acquisition of happiness what is the statute book but a record of such unhappy guesses or history but a narrative of their unsuccessful issues and what forwarder are we now is not our government as busy still as though the work of law-making commenced but yesterday has it made any apparent progress toward a final settlement of social arrangements does not rather each year entangle itself still further in the web of legislation confounding the already heterogeneous mass of enactments into still greater confusion nearly every parliamentary proceeding is a tacit confession of incompetency there is scarcely a bill introduced but is entitled an act to amend an act the whereas of almost every preamble heralds an account of the miscarriage of previous legislation alteration explanation and repeal form the staple employment of every session all our great agitations are for the abolition of institutions purporting to be for the public good witness those for the removal of the test and corporation acts for catholic emancipation for the repeal of the corn laws to which may now be added that for the separation of church and state the history of one scheme is the history of all first comes enactment then probation then failure next an amendment and another failure and after many alternate tinkerings and abortive trials arrives at length repeal followed by the substitution of some fresh plan doomed to run the same course and share a like fate the expediency philosophy however ignores this world full of facts though men have so constantly been balked in their attempts to secure by legislation any desired constituent of that complex whole greatest happiness it nevertheless continues to place confidence in the unaided judgment of the statesman it asks no guide it possesses no eclectic principle it seeks no clue whereby the tangled web of social existence may be unravelled and its laws discovered 
but holding up to view the great desideratum it assumes that after inspection of the aggregate phenomena of national life governments are qualified to concoct such measures as shall be expedient it considers the philosophy of humanity so easy the constitution of the social organism so simple the causes of a people's conduct so obvious that a general examination can give to collective wisdom the insight requisite for law-making it thinks that man's intellect is competent first to observe accurately the facts exhibited by associated human nature to form just estimates of general and individual character of the effects of religions customs superstitions prejudices of the mental tendencies of the age of the probability of future events etc etc and then grasping at once the multiplied phenomena of this ever agitated ever changing sea of life to derive from them that knowledge of their governing principles which shall enable him to say whether such and such measures will conduce to the greatest happiness of the greatest number if without any previous investigation of the properties of terrestrial matter newton had proceeded at once to study the dynamics of the universe and after years spent with the telescope in ascertaining the distances sizes times of revolution inclinations of axes forms of orbits perturbations etc of the celestial bodies had set himself to tabulate this accumulated mass of observations and to deduce from them the fundamental laws of planetary and stellar equilibrium he might have cogitated to all eternity without arriving at a result but absurd as such a method of research would have been it would have been far less absurd than is the attempt to find out the principles of public polity by a direct examination of that wonderfully intricate combination society it needs excite no surprise when legislation based upon the theories thus elaborated fails rather would success afford matter for extreme astonishment considering that men as yet so imperfectly understand man the instrument by which and the material on which laws are to act and that a complete knowledge of the unit man is but a first step to the comprehension of the mass society it seems obvious enough that to deduce from the infinitely ramified complications of universal humanity a true philosophy of national life and to found thereon a code of rules for the obtainment of greatest happiness is a task far beyond the ability of any finite mind section four yet another fatal objection to the expediency philosophy is to be found in the fact that it implies the eternity of government it is a mistake to assume that government must necessarily last forever the institution marks a certain stage of civilization is natural to a particular phase of human development it is not essential but incidental as amongst the bushmen we find the state antecedent to government so may there be one in which it shall have become extinct already has it lost something of its importance the time was when the history of a people was but the history of its government it is otherwise now the once universal despotism was but a manifestation of the extreme necessity of restraint feudalism serfdom slavery all tyrannical institutions are merely the most vigorous kinds of rule springing out of and necessary to a bad state of man the progress from these is in all cases the same less government constitutional forms mean this political freedom means this democracy means this in societies associations joint stock companies we have new agencies occupying fields filled in less advanced times and countries by the state with us the legislature is dwarfed by newer and greater powers is no longer master but slave pressure from without has come to be acknowledged as ultimate ruler the triumph of the anti corn law league is simply the most marked instance yet of this new style of government that of opinion overcoming the old style that of force it bids fair to become a trite remark that the lawmaker is but the servant of the thinker daily statecraft held in less repute even the times can see that the social changes thickening around us establish a truth sufficiently humiliating to legislative bodies and that the great stages of our progress are determined rather by the spontaneous workings of society connected as they are with the progress of art and science the operations of nature and other such unpolitical causes than by the proposition of a bill the passing of an act or any other events of politics or of state thus as civilization advances does government decay to the bad it is essential to the good not it is the check which national wickedness makes to itself and exists only to the same degree it continues his proof of still existing barbarism what a cage is to the wild beast law is to the selfish man restraint is for the savage the rapacious the violent not for the just the gentle the benevolent all necessity for external force implies a morbid state dungeons for the felon a straitjacket for the maniac crutches for the lame stays for the weak backed for the infirm of purpose a master for the foolish a guide but for the sound mind in a sound body none of these were there no thieves and murderers prisons would be unnecessary it is only because tyranny is yet rife in the world that we have armies 
barristers judges juries all the instruments of law exist simply because knavery exists magisterial force is the sequence of social vice and the policeman is but the complement of the criminal therefore it is that we call government a necessary evil what then must be thought of a morality which chooses this probationary institution for its basis builds a vast fabric of conclusions upon its assumed permanence selects acts of parliament for its materials and employs the statesman for its architect the expediency philosophy does this it takes government into partnership assigns to it entire control of its affairs enjoins all to defer to its judgment makes it in short the vital principle the very soul of its system when paley teaches that the interest of the whole society is binding upon every part of it he implies the existence of some supreme power by which that interest of the whole society is to be determined and elsewhere he more explicitly tells us that for the attainment of a national advantage the private will of the subject is to give way and that the proof of this advantage lies with the legislature still more decisive is bentham when he says that the happiness of the individuals of whom the community is composed that is their pleasures and their security is the sole end which the legislator ought to have in view the sole standard in conformity with which each individual ought as far as depends upon the legislature to be made to fashion his behavior these positions be it remembered are not voluntarily assumed they are necessitated by the premises if as his propounder tells us expediency means the benefit of the mass not of the individual of the future as much as of the present it presupposes someone to judge of what will most conduce to that benefit upon the utility of this or that measure the views are so various as to render an umpire essential whether productive duties or established religions or capital punishments or poor laws do or do not minister to the general good are questions concerning which there is such difference of opinion that were nothing to be done till all agreed upon them we might stand still to the end of time if each man carried out independently of a state power his own notions of what would best secure the greatest happiness of the greatest number society would quickly lapse into confusion clearly therefore morality established upon a maxim of which the practical interpretation is questionable involves the existence of some authority whose decision respecting it shall be final that is a legislature and without that authority such morality must ever remain inoperative see here then the predicament a system of moral philosophy professes to be a code of correct rules for the control of human beings fitted for the regulation of the best as well as the worst members of the race applicable if true to the guidance of humanity in its highest conceivable perfection government however is an institution originating in man's imperfection an institution confessedly begotten by necessity out of evil one which might be dispensed with were the world peopled with the unselfish the conscientious the philanthropic one in short inconsistent with the same highest conceivable perfection how then can that be a true system of morality which adopts government as one of its premises section five of the expediency philosophy must therefore be said in the first place that it can make no claim to a scientific character seeing that its fundamental proposition is not an axiom but simply an enunciation of the problem to be solved further that even supposing its fundamental proposition were an axiom it would still be inadmissible because expressed in terms possessing no fixed acceptation moreover were the expediency theory otherwise satisfactory it would be still useless since it requires nothing less than omniscience to carry it into practice and waiving all other objections we are yet compelled to reject the system which at the same time that it tacitly lays claim to perfection takes imperfection for its basis the doctrine of the moral sense section one there is no way of coming at a true theory of society but by inquiring into the nature of its component individuals to understand humanity in its combinations it is necessary to analyze that humanity in its elementary form for the explanation of the compound to refer back to the simple we quickly find that every phenomenon exhibited by an aggregation of men originates in some quality of man himself a little consideration shows us for instance that the very existence of society implies some natural affinity in its members for such a union it is pretty clear too that without a certain fitness in mankind for ruling and being ruled government would be an impossibility the infinitely complex organizations of commerce have grown up under the stimulus of certain desires existing in each of us and it is from our possession of a sentiment to which they appeal that religious institutions have been called into existence in fact on looking closely into the matter we find that no other arrangement is conceivable 
the characteristics exhibited by beings in an associated state cannot arise from the accident of combination but must be the consequences of certain inherent properties of the beings themselves true the gathering together may call out these characteristics it may make manifest what was before dormant it may afford the opportunity for undeveloped peculiarities to appear but it evidently does not create them no phenomenon can be presented by a corporate body but what there is a pre-existing capacity in its individual members for producing this fact that the properties of a mass are dependent upon the attributes of its component parts we see throughout nature in the chemical combination of one element with another dalton has shown us that the affinity is between atom and atom what we call the weight of a body is the sum of the gravitative tendencies of its separate particles the strength of a bar of metal is the total effect of an indefinite number of molecular adhesions and the power of the magnet is a cumulative result of the polarity of its independent corpuscles after the same manner every social phenomenon must have its origin in some property of the individual and just as the attractions and affinities which are latent in separate atoms become visible when those atoms are approximated so the forces that are dormant in the isolated man are rendered active by juxtaposition with his fellows this consideration though perhaps needlessly elaborated has an important bearing on our subject it points out the path we must pursue in our search after a true social philosophy it suggests the idea that the moral law of society like its other laws originates in some attribute of the human being it warns us against adopting any fundamental doctrine which like that of the greatest happiness to the greatest number cannot be expressed without presupposing a state of aggregation on the other hand it hints that the first principle of a code for the right ruling of humanity in its state of multitude is to be found in humanity in its state of unitude that the moral forces upon which social equilibrium depends are resident in the social atom man and that if we would understand the nature of those forces and the laws of that equilibrium we must look for them in the human constitution section two had we no other inducement to eat than that arising from the prospect of certain advantages to be thereby obtained it is scarcely probable that our bodies would be so well cared for as now one can quite imagine that were we deprived of that punctual monitor appetite and left to the guidance of some reasoned code of rules such rules were they never so philosophical and the benefits of obeying them never so obvious would form but a very inefficient substitute or instead of that powerful affection by which men are led to nourish and protect their offspring did there exist merely an abstract opinion that it was proper or necessary to maintain the population of the globe it is questionable whether the annoyance anxiety and expense of providing for our posterity would not so far exceed the anticipated good as to involve a rapid extinction of the species and if in addition to these needs of the body and of the race all of the requirements of our nature were similarly consigned to the sole care of the intellect were knowledge property freedom reputation friends sought only at its dictation then would our investigations be so perpetual our estimates so complex our decisions so difficult that life would be wholly occupied in the collection of evidence and the balancing of probabilities under such an arrangement the utilitarian philosophy would indeed have strong argument in nature for it would be simply applying to society that system of governance by appeal to calculated final results which already ruled the individual quite different however is the method of nature answering to each of the actions which it is requisite for us to perform we find in ourselves some prompter called a desire and the more essential the action the more powerful is the impulse to its performance and the more intense the gratification derived therefrom thus the longings for food for sleep for warmth are irresistible and quite independent of foreseen advantages the continuation of the race is secured by others equally strong whose dictates are followed not in obedience to reason but often in defiance of it that men are not impelled to accumulate the means of subsistence solely by a view to consequences is proved by the existence of misers in whom the love of acquirement is gratified to the neglect of the ends meant to be subserved we find employed a like system of regulating our conduct to our fellows that we may behave in the public sight in the most agreeable manner we possess a love of praise it is desirable that there should be a segregation of those best fitted for each other's society hence the sentiment of friendship and in the reverence felt by men for superiority we see a provision intended to secure the supremacy of the best may we not then reasonably expect to find a like instrumentality employed in impelling us to the line of conduct and the due observance of which consists what we call morality 
all must admit that we are guided to our bodily welfare by instincts that from instincts also spring those domestic relationships by which other important objects are compassed and that similar agencies are in many cases used to secure our indirect benefit by regulating social behavior seeing therefore that whenever we can readily trace our actions to their origin we find them produced after this manner it is to say the least of it highly probable that the same mental mechanism is employed in all cases that is the all-important questions of our being are fulfilled at the solicitations of desire so also are the less essential ones that upright conduct in each being necessary to the happiness of all there exists in us an impulse towards such conduct or in other words that we possess a moral sense the duty of which is to dictate rectitude in our transactions with each other which receives gratification from honest and fair dealing and which gives birth to the sentiment of justice in bar of this conclusion it is indeed urged that did there exist such an agency for controlling the behavior of man to man we should see universal evidence of its influence men would exhibit a more manifest obedience to its supposed dictates than they do there would be a greater uniformity of opinion as to the rightness or wrongness of actions and we should not as now find one man or nation considering as a virtue what another regards as a vice Allah is glorying in the piracy abhorred by civilized races a thug regarding as a religious act the ad assassination at which a european shuddered a russian piquing himself on his successful trickery a red indian in his undying revenge things which with us would hardly be boasted of overwhelming as this objection appears its fallacy becomes conspicuous enough if we observe the predicament into which the general application of such a test betrays us as thus none deny the universal existence of that instinct already adverted to which urges us to take the food needful to support life and none deny that such instinct is highly beneficial and in all likelihood essential to being nevertheless there are not wanting infinite evils and incongruities arising out of its rule all know that appetite does not invariably guide men aright in the choice of food either as to quality or quantity neither can any mention that its dictates are uniform when reminded of those unnumbered differences in the opinions called tastes which it originates in each the mere mention of gluttony drunkenness reminds us that the promptings of appetite are not always good carbuncled noses cadaverous faces fetid breaths and plethoric bodies meet us at every turn and our condolences are perpetually asked for headaches flatulence nightmare heartburn and endless other dyspeptic symptoms again equally great irregularities may be found in the workings of that generally recognized feeling parental affection amongst ourselves its beneficial sway seems tolerably uniform in the east however in fact the side is practiced now as it ever has been during the so-called classic times it was common to expose babes to the tender mercies of wild beasts and was the spartan practice to cast all the newly born who were not approved by a committee of old men into a public pit provided for the purpose if then it be argued that the want of uniformity in men's moral codes together with the weakness and partiality of their influence prove the non-existence of a feeling designed for the right regulation of our dealings with each other it must be inferred from analogous irregularities in men's conduct as to food and offspring that there are no such feelings as appetite and parental affection as however we do not draw this inference in with this one case we cannot do so in the other hence notwithstanding all the incongruities we must admit the existence of a moral sense to be both possible and probable section three but that we possess such a sense may be best proved by evidence drawn from the lips of those who assert that we have it not oddly enough bentham unwittingly derives his initial proposition from an oracle whose existence he denies and at which he sneers when it is appealed to by others one man he remarks speaking of shaftesbury says he has a thing made on purpose to tell him what is right and what is wrong and that it is called a moral sense and that he goes to work at his ease and says such and such a thing is right and such and such a thing is wrong why because my moral sense tells me it is now that bentham should have no authority for his own maxim other than this same moral sense is somewhat unfortunate for him yet on putting that maxim into critical hands we shall soon discover such to be the fact let us do this and so you think says the patrician that the object of our rule should be the greatest happiness to the greatest number such is our opinion answers the petitioning plebeian well now let us see what your principle involves suppose men to be as they very commonly are at variance in their desires on some given point and suppose that those forming the larger party will receive a certain amount of happiness each from the adoption of one course whilst those forming the smaller party will receive the same amount of happiness each from the adoption of the opposite course 
that if greatest happiness is to be our guide it must follow must it not that the larger party ought to have their way certainly that is to say if you the people are a hundred whilst we are ninety-nine your happiness must be preferred should our wishes clash and should the individual amounts of gratification at stake on the two sides be equal exactly our axiom involves that so then it seems that as in such a case you decide between the two parties by numerical majority you assume that the happiness of a member of the one party is equally important with that of a member of the other of course wherefore if reduced to its simplest form your doctrine turns out to be the assertion that all men have equal claims to happiness or applying it personally that you have as good a right to happiness as i have and pray sir who told you that you have as good a right to happiness as i have who told me i am sure of it i know it i feel it i nay nay that will not do give me your authority tell me who told you this how you got at it whence you derived it whereupon after some shuffling our petitioner is forced to confess that he has no other authority but his own feeling that he has simply an innate perception of the fact or in other words that his moral sense tells him so whether it rightly tells him so need not now be considered all that demands present notice is the fact that when cross-examined even the disciples of bentham have no alternative but to fall back upon an intuition of this much derided moral sense for the foundation of their own system section four in truth none but those committed to a preconceived theory can fail to recognize on every hand the workings of such a faculty from early times downward there have been constant signs of its presence signs which happily thicken as our own days approached the articles of magna carta embody its protests against oppression and its demands for a better administration of justice serfdom was abolished partly at its suggestion it encouraged wycliffe huss luther and knox in their contests with popery and by it were huguenots covenanters moravians stimulated to maintain freedom of judgment in the teeth of armed ecclesiasticism it dictated milton's essay on the liberty of unlicensed printing it piloted the Pilgrim Fathers to the New World. It supported the followers of George Fox under fines and imprisonment. And it whispered resistance to the Presbyterian clergy of 1662. In latter days it admitted that tide of feeling which undermined and swept away Catholic disabilities. Through the mouths of anti-slavery orators, it poured out its fire to the scorching of the selfish, to the melting of the good, to our national purification. It was its heat, too, which warmed our sympathy for the Poles, and made boil our indignation against their oppressor. Pent-up accumulations of it, let loose upon a long-standing injustice, generated the effervescence of a reform agitation. Out of its growing flame came those sparks by which protectionist theories were exploded, and that light which discovered to us the truths of free trade. By the passage of its subtle current is that social electrolysis affected which classes men into parties, which separates the nation into its positive and negative, its radical and conservative elements. At present it puts on the garb of anti-state church associations, and shows its presence in manifold societies for the extension of popular power. It builds monuments to political martyrs, agitates for the admission of Jews into Parliament, publishes books on the rights of women, petitions against class legislation, threatens to rebel against militia conscriptions, refuses to pay church rates, repeals oppressive debtor acts, laments over the distresses of Italy, and thrills with sympathy for the Hungarians. From it, as from a root, spring our aspirations after social rectitude. It blossoms in such expressions as, Do as you would be done by, honesty is the best policy, justice before generosity, and its fruits are equity, freedom safety section five but how it may be asked can a sentiment have a perception how can a desire give rise to a moral sense is there not here a confounding of the intellect with the emotion it is the office of a sense to perceive not to induce a certain kind of action whilst it is the office of an instinct to induce a certain kind of action and not to perceive but in the foregoing arguments motor and percipient functions are attributed to the same agent the objection seemed a serious one and were the term sense to be understood in its strictest acceptation would be fatal but the word is in this case as in many others used to express that feeling with which an instinct comes to regard the deeds and objects it is related to or rather that judgment which by a kind of reflex action it causes the intellect to form of them to elucidate this we must take an example and perhaps the love of accumulation will afford us as good a one as any we find then that conjoined with the impulse to acquire property there is what we call a sense of the value of property and we find the vividness of the sense to vary with the strength of the impulse contrast the miser and the spendthrift 
accompanying his constant desire to heap up the miser has a quite peculiar belief in the worth of money the most stringent economy he thinks virtuous and anything like the most ordinary liberality vicious whilst of extravagance he has an absolute horror whatever adds to a store seems to him good whatever takes from it bad and should a passing gleam of generosity lead him on some special occasion to open his purse he is pretty sure afterwards to reproach himself with having done wrong on the other hand whilst the spendthrift is deficient in the instinct of acquisition he also fails to realize the intrinsic worth of property it does not come home to him he has little sense of it hence under the influence of other feelings he regards saving habits as mean and holds that there is something noble in profuseness now it is clear that these opposite perceptions of the propriety or impropriety of certain lines of conduct do not originate with the intellect but with the emotional faculties the intellect uninfluenced by desire would show both miser and spendthrift that their habits were unwise whereas the intellect influenced by desire makes each think the other a fool but does not enable him to see his own foolishness now this law is at work universally each feeling is accompanied by a sense of the rightness of those actions which give it gratification it tends to generate convictions that things are good or bad according as they bring to it pleasure or pain and would always generate such convictions were it unopposed as however there is a perpetual conflict amongst the feelings some of them being an antagonism throughout life the results of proportional incongruity in the beliefs a similar conflict among these also a parallel antagonism so that it is only where a desire is very predominant or where no adverse desire exists that this connection between the instincts and the opinions they dictate becomes distinctly visible applying to the elucidation of the case in hand these facts explain how from an impulse to behave in the way we call equitable there will arise a perception that such behavior is proper a conviction that it is good this instinct or sentiment being gratified by a just action and distressed by an unjust action produces in us an approbation of the one and a disgust towards the other and these readily beget beliefs that the one is virtuous and the other vicious or referring again to the illustration we may say that as the desire to accumulate property is accompanied by a sense of the value of property so is the desire to act fairly accompanied by a sense of what is fair and thus limiting the word sense to the expression of this fact there is nothing wrong in attributing motor and percipient functions to the same agent it will perhaps be needful here to meet the objection that whereas according to the foregoing statement each feeling tends to generate notions of the rightness or wrongness of the actions towards which it is related and whereas morality should determine what is correct in all departments of conduct it is improper to confine the term moral sense to that which can afford directions in only one department this is quite true nevertheless seeing that our behavior towards each other is the most important part of our behavior and that in which we are most prone to err seeing also that this same faculty is so purely and immediately moral in its purpose and seeing further as we shall shortly do that its dictates are the only ones capable of reduction to an exact form we may show with some show of reason continue to employ that term with this restricted meaning section six assuming the existence in man of such a faculty as this for prompting him to right dealings with his fellows and assuming that it generates certain intuitions respecting those dealings it seems reasonable enough to seek in such intuitions the elements of a moral code attempts to construct the code so founded have from time to time been made they have resulted in systems based by shaftesbury and hutchinson on moral sense by reed and Beattie on common sense by price on understanding by clark on fitness of things by granville sharp on natural equity by others on rule of right natural justice law of nature law of reason right reason etc unsuccessful as these writers have been in the endeavor to develop a philosophical morality all of them if the foregoing reasoning be correct have consulted a true oracle though they have failed to systematize its utterances they have acted wisely in trying to do this an analysis of right and wrong so made is not indeed the profoundest and ultimate one but as we shall by and by see it is perfectly in harmony with that in its initial principle and coincident with it in its results against codes thus derived it is indeed alleged that they are necessarily worthless because unstable in their premises if say the objectors this moral sense to which all these writers directly or indirectly appeal possess no fixity gives no uniform response says one thing in europe and another in asia originates different notions of duty in each age each race each individual how can it afford a safe foundation for a systematic morality what can be more absurd than to seek a definite rule of right in the answers of so, so uncertain an authority even granting that there is no escape from this difficulty even supposing no method to exist by which from the source of moral philosophy can be drawn free from so fatal an imperfection there still results merely that same dilemma in which every other proposed scheme is involved if such a guy is unfit because its dictates are variable then must expediency also be rejected for the same reason 
if bentham is right in condemning moral sense as an anarchical and capricious principle founded solely upon internal and peculiar feelings then is his own maxim doubly fallacious is not the idea of greatest happiness a capricious one is not that also founded solely upon internal and peculiar feelings and even were the idea of greatest happiness alike in all would not his principle be still anarchical in virtue of the internal disagreement as to the means of realizing this greatest happiness all utilitarian philosophies are in fact liable to this charge of indefiniteness for there ever occurs the same unsettled question what is utility a question which as every newspaper shows us gives rise to endless disputes both as to the goodness of each desired end and the efficiency of every proposed means at the worst therefore in so far as want of scientific precision is concerned a philosophy found out in moral sense simply stands in the same category with all other known systems section seven but happily there is an alternative the force of the objection above set forth may be fully admitted without in any degree invalidating the theory notwithstanding appearances to the contrary it is still possible to construct upon this basis a purely synthetic morality proof against all such criticism the error pointed out is not one of doctrine but of application those who committed it did not start from a wrong principle but rather missed the right way from that principle to the sought for conclusions it was not in the oracle to which they appealed but in their method of interpretation that the writers of the shaftesbury school erred confounding the functions of feeling and reason they required sentiment to do that which should have been left to the intellect they were right in believing that there exists some governing instinct generating in us an approval of certain actions we call good and a repugnance to certain others we call bad but they were not right in assuming such instinct to be capable of intuitively solving every ethical problem submitted to it to suppose this was to suppose that moral sense could supply the place of logic for the better explanation of this point let us take an analogy from mathematics or rather some branch of it as geometry the human mind possesses a faculty that takes cognizance of measurable quantity which faculty to carry out the analogy let us term a geometric sense by the help of this we estimate the linear dimensions surfaces and bulks of surrounding objects and form ideas of their relationship to each other but in the endeavour to reduce the knowledge thus obtained to a scientific form we find that no reliance can be placed on the unaided decisions of this geometric sense in consequence of the conflicting judgments it makes in different persons on comparing notes however we discover that there are certain simple propositions upon which we all think alike such as things which are equal to the same thing are equal to one another the whole is greater than its part and agreeing upon these axioms as we call them these fundamental truths recognized by our geometric sense we find it becomes possible by successive deductions to settle all disputed points and to solve with certainty problems of the most complicated nature now if instead of adopting this method geometricians had persisted in determining all questions concerning lines angles squares circles and the like by the geometric sense if they had tried to discover whether the three angles of a triangle were or were not equal to two right angles and whether the areas of similar polygons were or were not in the duplicate ratio of their homologous sides by an effort of simple perception they would have made just the same mistakes that moralists make who try to solve all the problems of morality by the moral sense the reader will at once perceive the conclusion towards which this analogy points namely that the perception of the primary laws of quantity bears the same relationship to mathematics that this instinct of right bears to a moral system and that it is the office of the geometric sense to originate a geometric axiom from which reason may deduce a scientific geometry so it is the office of the moral sense to originate a moral axiom from which reason may develop a systematic morality and varying the illustration it may be further remarked are just as erroneous notions of mechanics for instance that large bodies fall faster than small ones that water rises in a pump by section that perpetual motion is possible together with the many other mistaken opinions formed by unaided mechanical sense are set aside by the conclusions synthetically deduced from those primary laws of matter which the mechanical sense recognizes so may we expect the multitudes of conflicting beliefs about human duty dictated by unaided moral sense to disappear before the deductions scientifically drawn from some primary law of man which the moral sense recognizes section eight on reviewing the claims of the moral sense doctrine it appears that there is an a priori reason for expecting the first principle of social morality to originate in some feeling power or faculty of the individual quite in harmony with this belief is the inference that as desire is found to be the incentive to action or motives are readily analyzable it is probably the universal incentive that the conduct we call moral is determined by it as well as other conduct moreover we find that even the great maxim of the expediency philosophy presupposes some tendency in man towards right relationship with his fellow and some correlated perception of what that right relationship consists in 
there are sundry phenomena of social life both past and present that will illustrate the influence of this supposed moral sense which are not ready explicable upon any other hypothesis assuming the existence of such a faculty there appears reason to think that its monitions afford a proper basis for systematic morality and to the demur that their variability unfits them for this purpose it is replied that to say the least the foundations of all other systems are equally open to the same objection finally however we discover that this difficulty is apparent only and not real for that whilst the decisions of this moral sense upon the complex cases referred to it are inaccurate and often contradictory it may still be capable of generating a true fundamental intuition which can be logically unfolded into a scientific morality end of preface and introduction to social statics by herbert spencer